I'm a doctor, a dermatologist, and I'm trained to look at patterns. I was attracted to the skin in dermatology because it's the largest organ of the body. And on the surface, all look similar. But actually, there are thousands of patterns that tell us about our health and if we have disease. Besides being a dermatologist, my area of work focuses on angiogenesis. That's the process the body uses to grow new blood vessels. It's the pattern of these blood vessels that I want to talk to you about. How we can tame them in order to maintain health, and not just in the skin, but throughout the whole body. And how your healthcare can be a do-it-yourself activity. Now, when you hear the word dermatology, you probably think about Botox and acne and lasers. I know this because the easiest way for me to make new friends at a cocktail party is to identify myself as a dermatologist. <laughs> so you probably don't know that what I deal with a lot is cancer. Cancer is fed by abnormal blood vessels. And when I get underneath people's skin, there is a whole pattern of blood vessels that everything above it is dependent on for oxygen and nutrients. Normally, these blood vessels are balanced and they're normal in their pattern. In diseases, they grow wild and untamed and can also feed the cancer cells, allowing them to grow. This is one of my patients. She's a 74-year-old woman who grows skin cancers all over her body. This is her 39th one. It's an invasive squamous cancer. She refused to go to surgery to get cut one more time. In order to help her, I had to create my own version of a skin cream made up of a cocktail of medicines in order to starve her skin cancer by cutting off his blood supply. And with topical therapy alone, the skin cancer after 12 weeks melted away and stayed away. And all subsequent biopsies have been negative. I was able to treat all of her tumors this way, and she only came back to see me when she was sick with more. Many people would consider this a big success. But in looking back at this case, what I realize is that what we doctors provide is really sick care. It's not really health care. Perhaps health care is what people should be doing in between their doctor visits. And let me suggest why we should all care about this. There's a growing global epidemic. In obesity, one out of three of us will become obese. In diabetes, two out of five will develop it. And in cancer, one out of two people in this auditorium will eventually get it. In fact, we're all growing microscopic cancers in our body all the time. While genetics often play a role, these diseases start from habits that develop in childhood. This is my daughter. <laughs> she doesn't have any bad habits yet, I hope. But I certainly think all the time about what could I tell her to proactively keep her healthy. And here she is with her great-granduncle in China. He's healthy and exactly 100 years older than she is to the date. So what does he done in his life that she can learn from, that we can all learn from to stay healthy? Well, there are clues and patterns about how we can achieve this. What do people do who live in Okinawa and Sardinia and China's longevity villages and Mount Athos that leads to an extraordinary large number of people who live to a century with low to no rates of cancer, Alzheimer's, stroke, obesity? What are they doing? Well, I've got a secret to tell you. The answer isn't in the hands of pharmaceutical companies, or in hospitals, or maybe not even in the hands of doctors like me. The answer lies in what you can do yourself, DIY. Do it yourself. We're all doing it. It's home improvement, growing our own vegetables, we live in a culture of DIY. We've all heard of things that are good for us to do. That's what I call it. 
It's good to get out and exercise, good to eat healthier foods. But what I want to tell you is that you can take action to prevent disease and maintain health. So I'm not talking about generalities. I'm talking about specific actions backed up by scientific data. And I'm going to share with you some of our research results that haven't been seen before so that you know how much to do, how frequently to do it, and how the dose of that action will impact on your health. So let me share with you my top 10 list to start the DIY health revolution. So number one is sleep. We all know it's good for us. But why? And how much sleep? Melatonin is the natural brain chemical that regulates our circadian sleep clock. It's triggered by darkness, goes up when we sleep, and then goes down at sunrise. What you may not know is that melatonin also suppresses cancers. In fact, breast cancers in laboratory animals grow very, very quickly. When you give melatonin, the cancers are starved, the volume is suppressed, and the tumor stays small. When you give melatonin pills to metastatic cancer patients, the levels of their cancer stimulators goes down in the people who did better. But the best way to get melatonin is by getting the right amount of sleep. How much? People who sleep at least seven hours a night have a decreased risk for getting colon cancer by 53%. Eight out of 10 people who live to 100 get at least this much sleep as well. You know who's got the most disrupted sleep? It's night shift workers. They've got chronic suppression of melatonin. Over two dozen studies have shown that they have a 35% increased risk for breast, prostate, colon, cervical, ovarian cancer. So get seven hours of sleep, don't do night shift work, and try not to pull so many all-nighters. DIY number two. Can I see a show of hands of how many people read a smartphone or tablet at bedtime? It's a lot of people, almost everyone. Well, you're in good company. 90% of Americans surveyed say they do the same thing several times a week. This is a study of people who read a real book before they went to bed and had their bloods measured. Melatonin in them go up normally. In comparison, people who read a tablet at bedtime had suppressed melatonin. In fact, in as little as a week, their melatonin was suppressed by 55%. So power down those devices and keep them out of the bedroom. DIY number three, exercise. We all know it's good for our heart, but it also can keep cancer at bay. After only a half an hour of moderate walking on a treadmill, natural cancer suppressors in our body go up and they stay elevated for a prolonged period of time. So it's not surprising that women who exercise four hours a week are able to have a 67% reduced risk of breast cancer. And this was in a study of 3,500 women, ages 40 to 50, many of whom had never exercised before when they were younger. So it's never too late to start. DIY number four. This is something that we all do three times a day. In order to screen foods and beverages, we developed a research tool so that we could test food extracts for their potency. Let me share with you some of the data. The first thing we did is we tested cancer drugs. So the higher the bar, the more potent. And here are the dietary factors. You can see that there's spices and herbs and tea fruits, vegetables, just a small sampling of the systematic screening that we're doing, starting with foods that are enriched in the diet of centenarians. So what are the kind of foods I think we should all be eating? Let's start talking about wine. Everybody loves wine. 
Red wine, in particular, contains resveratrol and other bioactive molecules that starve cancers. We're finding that different red wines from different grape varietals vary in their potency. Which do you think is the best? Well, the next time you're choosing, you might consider trying a Cabernet Sauvignon, a Cabernet Franc, or Petit Verdot. Not only that, but we know from studies of 84,000 men that drinking one glass of red wine a day lowers the risk of getting lung cancer in smokers by 60%. And that's not true for white wine or for beer. DIY number five, cruciferous vegetables. These are bok choy, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. They contain bioactive molecules that are also potent in our system. How many people here cut off the stem of the broccoli and throw it away? It's because we're all used to eating the florette, and it's the part that we can buy frozen. Our system allows us to test the comparative activity of different food parts. So here you can see the activity of the florette, and here is the activity of the stock. They're both potent, but clearly we're throwing away a valuable part of the vegetable. So let's eat our stocks. <laughs> DIY number six are tomatoes. Tomatoes are a rich source of lycopene, and we know lycopene starves cancers. In the study of 1,000 women, those who consumed the equivalent of a cherry tomato every single day had a 38% lower risk of breast cancer. We're also gathering insights in how to optimize the potency of foods as part of everyday meals. For example, what's the best way of eating a tomato? Is it raw or cooked? What do you think? Well, even a quick saute increases the amount of lycopene by 50%. If you simmer it for 15 minutes, it goes up even higher. When we eat the tomato, lycopene goes up in our blood, but get this, if you cook the tomato in olive oil, the absorption is twice as much. <laughs> DIY number seven. Have you noticed all the interesting foods that are now available in markets? Well, dare yourself to try new things, especially the ones that are brightly colored that grab your eye. Why? Because it's the pigment of these foods that are bioactive and are beneficial for us. I'm talking about the purple anthocyanins in Peruvian potatoes, the red beta lanes in beets, the bright yellows lutein's of avocados. Papaya contains beta cryptoxanthin. This pigment even starves the earliest forms of cancer. For example, HPV is the virus that causes abnormal pap smears, cervical cancer. In a study of HPV-positive women, those who had half a cup of papayas per week had 82% reduced risk of getting the earliest form of cervical cancer. So think about eating bright colors. DIY number eight. I want to turn now to talk about disease that's a growing epidemic in our society, and that's obesity. Everybody's talking about cutting out trans fats, don't eat so many carbs. But can you imagine the idea of eating more of something in order to combat obesity? Well, just like cancer, fat grows when blood vessels grow and shrinks when it's starved of its blood supply. Green tea tames the blood system. This is a CT scan of a person with a normal BMI. And a CT scan is a cross-sectional area through the waist. This is what abdominal fat looks like in somebody who's obese. In this controlled trial, people who drank the equivalent of six cups of green tea a day were able to lose 6% of their fat in 12 weeks. And this is one of the hardest places to get rid of fat. Fat isn't the only thing green tea gets rid of. Asians love to drink green tea, and it's a habit of the centenarians who live there. In the study of 69,000 women in China, 
Those who drank one cup of green tea a day lowered the risk of getting colon cancer by 37%. Here's something interesting. For those of you who are tea drinkers, how long do you steep your tea bag for? Where are you on this graph? Well, it turns out, the longer you steep, the more the catechins get out into the beverage that you're drinking. The catechins are the active molecules that starve cancers. And if you dunk your tea bag, you get more faster. DIY number nine are omega-3 fatty acids, which we tend to think about for heart health. But omega-3s are critical for brain development. Did you know that even starting in utero, the more omega-3s the mother consumes, the higher her child's future IQ at age eight. So there are long-lasting benefits. In order to get the highest level on this chart, you can do that by eating a three to four ounce serving of salmon. That's about the size of a deck of cards, three times a week. We can all do that. DIY number 10, do you remember my patient with skin cancer? Well, there's not a whole lot she can do about lifetime sun exposure, but she can drink coffee regularly. <laughs> a study of 25,000 people showed that drinking three or more cups of coffee a day can decrease the risk of getting the most common form of skin cancer, BCC, by 20%. So it really is good to the last drop. <laughs> so can you dare yourself every week to make one change and maintain it that makes a difference in your life and your health? <laughs> I'm going to leave you in a moment with my top 10 list from top to bottom again. But first, I hope I've shown you that by seeing the right patterns and things that are really all around us, lets us see the world in a new way. It also can empower us to be part of a do-it-yourself health revolution in preventing disease. Albert Einstein once said, intellectuals solve problems. Geniuses prevent them. I dare you all to be geniuses. Thank you. Thank you.